my title, uh, as you know, is whether you know, Islam is an obstacle. I mean, the title is Turkey and Europe is Islam an obstacle. There can be other questions about Turkey's EU membership. We can ask Turkey and Europe, is France an obstacle? Because you know, the French are particularly not very welcoming to Turkey uh, in, in the way they you know, uh, look at European affairs. But I'll focus on Islam today because there are some understandable but exaggerated questions about the compatibility of Islam and an open, a modern democratic society in the West. For, as I said, understandable reasons. Because we know, you know some extremist groups have done terrible things in the name of Islam. Uh, but, but the Westerners who look at those things sometimes have fallen to the mistake of extrapolating from those examples to the larger Muslim civilization and, and thinking that those examples represent all Muslims or all Muslim groups or Islamic uh, societies and movements. And that's a mistake. And actually, the Turkish example is actually a good way to see that mistake. Uh, when I speak about these issues, like I sometimes ask a question to my friends who are like also Westerners. Like I say, which country in Europe do you think has the highest percentage of Muslims with regards to its overall population? And people think about it, people say, is it Germany or France or the UK? These are the common answers. But the right answer is Bulgaria. Uh, Bulgaria has the highest you know, percentage of Muslim population with regards to the overall population. Because the Muslims of Bulgaria, who are Turks and Pomaks, Pomaks are Bulgarian speaking Muslims, are living there for at least five centuries. So we don't hear about the you know, Muslim question or the Islamic issue or the problem in Bulgaria because they're part of that society and they've been living there for ages. Uh, but we have sometimes you know, questions or concerns about the integration problem in, 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 uh, in France or in Germany, less in Germany but, or, or in the UK. And I think that tells something to us and that, tell, that shows that the, the problem about Muslims so-called uh, in, in Europe is mostly an Im immigrants problem. If those Muslims were indigenous populations of those countries, like in, in, in Greece as well, or in Bulgaria, we probably would have a much different you know, situation and probably we would not be speaking about the problem at all. In other words, the fact that some Muslims have migrated to Europe became manual laborers, in the, in, in, at least in the first generation, and felt alien in those societies. And the fact that none of, some of those societies were not that welcoming to you know, uh, diversity, unlike the US. Uh, has created some dynamics in Europe, the ghettoized uh, culture. And that has actually reinforced some of the problems, which would actually would be much milder in that case. Uh, so when you look at, for example, Muslim communities uh, in, in the UK, you see that, for example, Pakistanis coming from the least educated areas of Pakistan most of the time, because they're jobless, there, they went there to find jobs. And uh, that was one issue to begin with. And then they could not integrate into society, and they rather ghettoized, not all of them, they're, they're successful ways of integration and assimilation, but some of them created their cultural ghettos, rejected the society, and that reinforced the more radical trends or more rejectionary or anti-modern trends in those societies. Uh, whereas, you know, in a Muslim society, which, is, you know, which, has, its, which has its own way to democratization and you know, uh, modernization, you would maybe see a different case. And that's why, actually, the Turkish case is quite interesting. Uh, because when you, look at the, when you look at the history of Turkey in the past few centuries, you see that, actually, Turkey has a very unique story of Islam, especially, a unique, especially when it is compared with the Arab world, and especially compared with countries like Saudi Arabia, which has a very you know, uh, rigid interpretation of Islam. Uh, why Turkey is different you know, uh, from the, the rest of the Muslim world? Of course, every country is different from the rest of the, I mean, Malaysia is different from the rest of the Muslim world, Bosnia is different, and Saudis are different in their own way. But Turkey is generally seen as a more positive example. And why is that? Well, some people give a question, they say, oh, Turkey has been a secular republic from the 1920s, and that's why. Uh, of course, this answer implies uh, the presumption that a secular state had to push religion to to some margins of society so that you would have an experience like Turkey. But that's not an answer that I share. 
Uh, and I think the Turkish story is much more complex than that. Uh, and because we should look into the nature of Turkish Islam to begin with, which was there before the you know, Secular Republic, and which was there during the Ottoman Empire, to see the differences. Uh, Turkish Islam, or the Islam in Turkey, or in whatever you, which term you prefer, has been quite different, for example, than the, uh, the Islam in, for example, in the Arabian Peninsula, First of all, because Sufism has been a cherished tradition in Turkey from the very beginning. There are some Sunni schools who regard Sufism as a, as a heresy, especially the Wahhabi schools sees that way. Whereas in Turkey, the mainstream Sunni thinking has been always uh, like synthesized with Sufism. And there was, a, there was a great respect for the Sufi tradition. And Sufism, as you would know, is like mystical. But besides being mystical, it has a great emphasis on values like tolerance and reaching out to the other. And you know, finding common common grounds between different people, between different faiths. Uh, second, uh, second, and uh, secondly, Turks were also Turks are from the Hanafi school of Sunni, Sunni Islam, which is among the four different schools of uh, Sunni Islam, which is the most flexible and often the most lenient in jurisprudence. They are also subscribers to the Maturidi school in theology. You know, I don't want to get too, too, too detail, but that's again when you compare in the Sunni spectrum, that is the most. That's the school which gives most uh, role, the highest role for reason in understanding uh, religion, because it was a biggest. It was a big debate in medieval Islam whether reason had a justified role in understanding revelation. So some people rejected reason, and that was the Hanbali school, which ultimately became the Wahhabi school in the modern world, whereas uh, Maturidi school said that you know, reason has a justified role. God gave us revelation, and God gave us reason to understand through both. Um, besides those like doctrinal you know, points to begin with, I think Turkey had a different experience than many other Muslim countries in the past two centuries. Uh, one, was, one of those experiences was the Ottoman modernization. Uh, you know, there is this idea that, you know, uh, especially secularists, like diehard secularists, believe that Turkey was in darkness before the republic. And you know, Turkey was like Taliban. And then we, there came the secular French Enlightenment uh, via Kemalism, which you know, just enlightened the whole nation. But there's still the danger of going backward to darkness. That's a very popular paradigm in Turkey. That's popular, but that's not really actually uh, quite convincing. Uh, because when you look at the modernization of Turkey, you see it begins in the 19th century with the Ottomans. Uh, the Ottoman Empire being the closest Muslim power to the West, at some point realized that there are some new things in the West. And not just technology and science, but also new institutions, like parliament, like democracy, like, like, like elections, or like the rule of law, or like a constitution. And the Ottoman Empire gradually adopted all these uh, Western inventions, which Muslims thought had their roots in, in Islamic ideals as well, in the, in the 19th century, in the uh, Tanzimat, uh, the reorganization, Edict of 1839, uh, Turkey, uh, ed, I mean, the, the, the empire, the Ottoman Empire, gave equal rights to all citizens, which was reinforced later with the Islahat Farman, uh, with the Reform Edict of 1856 which basically established that Jews and Christians are equal citizens of the empire. In the pre-modern era, equal citizenship was not a common idea, and it was not there in Europe as well. And in Islamic law, they were granted some rights, Jews and Christians, but they were not considered as equal citizens. The empire gave them the right to be equal citizens. That's why in the Ottoman parliament, which convened in 1876, but which was you know, suspended, but which reconvened again in the second constitutional period, one third of the Ottoman parliament were Jewish, Armenian, or Greek parliamentarians. Uh, so there is a story of democracy beginning with it all within the Ottoman Empire as well. Unfortunately, the Ottoman Empire, uh, well, unfortunately from some perspective, <laughs> it crumbled. Um, it depends on whether you find a nation state or empire is more, more preferable. And I think uh, I might be a little more on the less nation state you know, favoring side. Uh, but the Ottoman Empire crumbled, uh, as you know, uh, during World War I. And the most tragic uh, event in Ottoman history took place, the, uh, uh, the ethnic cleansing of Ottoman Armenians. And that's a very tragic story that I think we Turks should uh, take, a, take a, a closer look and more honest look and a more self-critical look. 
But we should see that that happened not because of the Ottoman system, but because of the fall of the Ottoman system. Here was a multi multicultural, pluralistic empire, which lived that way for six centuries. But because of nationalism, which influenced every ethnic group in the Ottoman Empire. It included many groups in the Balkans as well. And ultimately influ influenced Turks. And, and you had this you know, uh, clash and, and the, uh, the forceful expulsion of Armenians in, from the Ottoman Empire. So what I want to emphasize there is that uh, Turkish Islam is a, is a form of Islam which has always had the idea of living with the other, with the non-Muslims. And this was institutionalized as equal citizenship in the Ottoman, uh, sorry, in the 19th century. So this is not a shocking idea you know, for, for Muslims in Turkey. Whereas in Saudi Arabia, I mean, non-Muslims are simply not allowed to enter certain parts of the country, and not a, no church is allowed to even exist in any, in, in, in any, on any Saudi soil. Uh, and in the Republican era, uh, Turkey, of course, uh, had this. Uh, Turkey, the, the Republic was founded by Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, the war hero who you know saved Turkey from occupation, and won the war of liberation. Uh, but and I think that's something that every Turk should be grateful for. But after that, you know, the, the politics of Ataturk is something that should be open to debate. And I have my criticism that, criticisms there. And the criticism is that instead of uh, continuing the democratic tradition, which had started to evolve in the Ottoman Empire, rather Ataturk and his followers, the Kemalists, as now, <coughs> turned Turkey into a single party regime by banning all opposition. And, and imposing a particular form of modernization, which very much was inspired by the French Enlightenment or the German materialism, cultural materialism of the 19th century. And that's why the secularism, laïcité, uh, or laïclic, as we say in Turkish, that emerged in Turkey was quite different from the separation of church and state that you have here in the United States. Uh, the US separation of church and state, the First Amendment, is about protecting religion from the state as well as protecting the state from religion. But in Turkey, the protection of religion from the state was not very much emphasized. It was rather considered that the state has the rightful you know, uh, role to uh, minimize the role of religion in, in society. Hence came things like the headscarf ban and you know, bans on Sufi orders and all Islamic groups, which still is a big issue in Turkey. Uh, and during their interaction with this authoritarian model of secularism, uh, which also was combined with a very, very vibrant form of Turkish nationalism, you know, Muslims, the more practicing Muslims, in Turkey, like the whole population is like nominally uh, Muslim. And uh, we have Christian and Jewish minorities, but they're very small. Like 99% of Turkey is always said to be Muslim. But the more Islamic minded, the more practicing uh, m Muslims in Turkey, were generally considered as not a part of the elite. So the elite was the one, the people who identified with the, uh, with the secularist <coughs> regime. And uh, for a long time, the, uh, the more practicing pious Muslims in Turkey, people who pray five times a day, who, whose family would have headscarves, and who would be pious in all, in, 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 in all their uh, ways and con culturally conservative, they were marginalized, and the parties that, that they brought to power were t taken down by the military with, with military coups, uh, or their parties were closed down. So we had this dichotomy. Turkey was a, a parliamentary system, a democracy of some sorts. But the military, which you know, aspired to protect the principles of Kemalist revolution, was always l limiting uh, democracy and democratically elected politicians. But things started to change in the past, I would say, 10 to 15 years. Uh, because for a long time, the, these pious practicing Muslims of Turkey perceived the secular authoritarian system, which violated their religious freedom to, to a great extent, as an extension of the West. These were you know, a westernized elite who dine and wine like the Westerners do, and they have good relations with the West. So the secular elite was seen as just what the West brought to Turkey. So there was a rejectionist attitude by not all, but many of the conservative Muslims in Turkey. But slowly and slowly, they, as they opened up to the world, thanks to, the, thanks to globalization, thanks to free market economy, which created a lot of Muslim businessmen, which, which made you know, 
which had you know, uh, connections with the outside world. Uh, the conservative Muslims in Turkey start to realize that the problem is not uh, a you know, Western model. It is actually the lack of the Western model, which is democracy. It is they realize that the problem is not the West. The problem is the so-called Westernizers at home who claim to rule the nation because you know, they're, they got some, some, some wisdom from some enlightenment idea. In other words, the pious conservative Muslims in Turkey, not all of them, but the party they represented and, you know, and the civil society groups that they supported, slowly and slowly started to be, be more sympathetic to the European Union idea. Because they realized that you know, Muslims in Europe are actually freer than the Muslims in Turkey in, in many ways. I mean, uh, you cannot walk into a Turkish campus. Well, it's changing now, but until last year, we can say, with a headscarf. There is, in the, in, the, the, in the entrance of the universities, there used to be what I call the secularism police. They were waiting there and you know, stopping old ladies with a headscarf. In, the, in Saudi Arabia, you know, there's a religious police. We had the opposite version. We had the secularism police which force every practicing woman to just out of the campus or take it off. So whereas those ladies, uh, pious you know, ladies who want to be loyal to their religion, but also study sociology, science, and you know, be a part of the modern world, they had one chance to go to, to the West. They came to US, they came to Europe. Uh, there are now like thousands of Turkish uh, young whaled students in, in Austria. I went there you know, to lecture them. It's, because you know they, they they can't go to Turkish universities, so they came to Austria, and and now I, I we they went took me to a nice schnitzel restaurant, you know, in, in in Vienna, and I realized that they have become quite accustomed to life uh, in, in an open society. Uh, they appreciate the religious freedom they find there, and they say, well, we in back in Turkey we need the standards here, we need the democracy like these guys have here. That explains you why the the incumbent Justice and Development Party, the AKP which is in power since 2002, have been more enthusiastic uh, for European accession than its secular political rivals. Uh, the AKP has been also quite successful in doing some reforms, although it has slowed down over time and you know, it's not as enthusiastic as it was in the beginning, uh, partly because Europe is not that enthusiastic in welcoming Turkey, but it, also there are problems within Turkey as well. So uh, the AKP still can be criticized for you know, not being as you know, reformist as it should be. But, at the same, but they have been more pro-European in, in, uh, when compared with other parties. And not just being pro-European, they have been more, relatively more liberal when you compare again with the secular rivals on issues like the Kurdish question. Like it was illegal in Turkey to speak about the Kurds. Uh, in 1982, a politician went into jail for saying, I am a Kurd and there are Kurds in Turkey. <coughs> that was considered as separatist propaganda under the military regime. So Kurdish language was banned and you know, Kurdish music was banned until the 90s. But things started to change and now we have a 24-hour uh, state channel which you know, broadcasts in Kurdish. And there are Kurdish language schools. And then we are discussing whether we should have you know, Kurdish classes in public schools as well, something that I support. And I criticize AKP for, for being not steadfast enough. But they have done all these changes. I mean, they, they brought many reforms. Or the issue that when it comes to the Christians in Turkey, the rights of the ecumenical patriarchate, uh, the Halki Seminary, which was closed down by a military uh, regime in 1971, because of nationalist considerations rather than Islamic. Um, these are also problems. And, and uh, again, this government, the current government, which represents the more pious segment of a Turkish society, have, has proven to be, it's not a full glass yet, but it's, this is a half glass when compared with the secular, some of the secular nationalists in the country who don't even support anything about you know, <coughs> minority rights. Uh, some secularists actually have argued that if we open the Halki Seminary, which belongs to the Ecumenical Patriarchate, I mean, it should, need to, it should be reopened right away. They said, if you open that, then the Muslims will ask schools for themselves. So no, I mean, nobody should get schools, like private schools, and all education should be given by the state and according to its very well-defined <coughs> lines. That's why I think uh, now, right now in Turkey, we have a, a, an evolving, it's a work in process, but like an evolving Muslim culture, which appreciates democracy which understands that an authoritarian regime 
is bad. It is bad if it is created in the name of secularism. It's bad if it's created in the name of religion. It's bad if it's created in the name of progress or in the name of whatever. And, and if we want to speak about progress, that should go, first of all, the first rule should be freedom, that freedom, everybody should be free to live their lives uh, as they want. So, and I think that Muslim culture in Turkey should not be threatening to Europe at all. I mean, we, we, this, is a, this is a culture which actually appreciates many things that the, West civiliza the Western civilization has achieved, and which sees those things not as exclusively Western, but actually universal, which all, all people can enjoy. Uh, that's why I think the Europeans who look at some of the troubles that they have within some of the immigrant communities, uh, troubles which come from the fact that they're immigrants rather than what, what religion that they, they have. Uh, and then extrapolate that to Turkey and think that, oh, we have problems with two million Muslims in, in Paris right now. What if Turkey, 70 million more of them come to? Uh, and I think that's a naive way to you know, look at these issues. And there's, of course, there's also the fact that Turkish economy is doing better than any other European economy right now. And there are predictions that Turkey will be one of the great four economies of Europe in, in, in a decade to come. So I mean, if, if Europeans open borders, I don't think that you know, millions of Turks will you know, run to you know, Paris to be beggars and you know, wash the wash cars when they're stopping a red light and ask for some money. That's probably, I mean, maybe a few people. But, the, but Turkey is economically actually quite prosperous. And uh, things might change, but Turkish economy has done well. So the fear that you know, a Turkey within Europe will uh, you know, disturb this wonderful you know, nature of European societies, I think, is a little exaggerated. Plus, Europeans are not making too many babies, so their population <laughs> is shrinking anyway, so they need some new people anyway. So Turkey might not be that, that much of a terrible place to you know, have new people coming in. Uh, and I think, ultimately, if Turkey joins the European Union, uh, I don't expect to happen, that to happen right away. And I think I actually value the EU process sometimes more than the actual membership. The process has helped Turkey a lot. Uh, but if Turkey joins the EU one day, maybe a decade from now, I mean, we're saying a decade from now, like I was saying a decade from now five years ago, and it's, it's always a decade from now. Uh, but still, the process is valuable. I think it should continue. And it is good for the minorities in Turkey. It's good for the majority in Turkey. It's good for uh, you know, all those internal issues uh, of my country. But also, it will be a, like a heroic, like an iconic telltale uh, example showing that, you know, a Muslim society can be a part of a, you know, Western organization.